Don't make me activate your negative space. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And I'm Dan. And this is the Concept Crucible podcast. Allegedly. 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 And today, we are digging deep into some genres or areas of literature because Dan is here and we're going to talk about books. Mm -hmm. So, Icebreaker. Ryan, what is one of your formative books? We do this every time we talk about books and it's never going to get old. No. We're always going to be forcing me to try to think of books and then try to limit it down. Oh, it's so great. That's why he's going first. It's because I'm still thinking. But, so, mine's technically not one book. (laughs) Sorry. He's not sorry. Two answers for everything. No, it's, 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 it's one answer. It's just it's a series of books. All right. Uh, but if you're going to talk about formative books with yep. young Ryan, the the whole of the Calvin and Hobbes series. Ooh. That's I legit. Mean, I mean, I, I may have come across this in a weird way. Like, it was the, the book that I always brought into the bathroom with me, and that's where I ended up, like... Like for an hour sitting there reading Calvin and Hobbes as a child. Young Ryan's been pooping for an awful long time. Yeah, yeah. but um, when I when I think back to you know like young Ryan, so it's Calvin and Hobbes is one of those one of those stories, and I'm going to say story instead of a series of comics because really it was written episodically and whatnot. Yeah, it's one of those stories that when I read it as a kid, it was funny. Because I related to a six-year-old with a stuffed animal. And I always wanted, like, my own imaginary best friend. You can get one. Yeah, they're really cheap. I know. Seriously. But I... So I always... I always enjoyed the stories. You can get one now, even. I, I enjoyed the imagination. Mm-hmm. When I came back to it as an adult, and I understood, like, the, the philosophical conversations, the funny adult humor that was built into it... It's one of those stories that, yeah, when you read it multiple times, you get the, especially at different phases of your life, you get those different things out of it. And so I came across it through the anthologies, and I have a, a bunch of them because I stole them from my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and and occasionally I'll I'll pick it up off the off the bookshelf and I'll and I'll thumb through it and I'll look at a couple of them. And it's just it's one it's so, amazing. I, I can't quite put into words just how amazing. it so is. So I will go out on a limb here. Yeah. And I will say that you didn't, in fact, steal them from your dad, and that your dad has bequeathed them to you. He's not dead. No, but he has given them to you. Fair. Out of still bequeath. Yeah. Reg- out of recognition that that is a part of you growing up. It could be. It could be. I that's don't know. Some, that's some, like, supreme dadsmanship yeah, right there. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was quite that intentional as just me just stealing it. I give your dad the benefit of the dad. But, I mean, it, when you frame it that way, it does... Tr- it does tug at my man emotions and makes me think of like, we have a word on the podcast for man feelings cat's cradle uh, isn't it just like that. isn't it just feelings yes yes yeah. yes it is yes it, tug, it tugs at my man motions <laughs> your and man mo- your feelings and, and like suddenly gets in the yeah. chesticles <laughs> yeah and the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon <laughs> so mine i will i will give dan some more time to think <laughs> um there's just too many options mine harkens back to nine-year-old jim Um, And nine-year-old Jim found a book in a bookstore, uh, as one does. It was called Dark Sword Adventures. It's by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman and I think a couple of other people. Now, I had read the Dark Sword trilogy. In fact, if you look to your right, Ryan, and by right I mean left, because Dan is on your right, you can see one of the Dark Sword books on the shelf there. Uh, The first one, Forging of the Dark Sword. And the Dark Sword was a, a really weird, neat trilogy. I'd never read anything like it. Uh, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, who would go on to write uh, The Rose of the Prophet, Star of the Guardians, um, the Dragonlance books. They were most famous for creating the setting of Dragonlance in Dungeons & Dragons. And Dark Sword Adventures was like this secret indie Dark Sword book that I'd never heard of. And I was like, damn. And I got my hands on it. And I was like, this is going to be so cool. And I read the first half of it. Because it was like short stories and stuff about the same world that all the, that the main trilogy came in. And I wasn't as into that at nine. I was like, no, I want to read about all the like characters that I already know. But I read it. I read it a couple of times. But the back half of the book had all these charts and appendices. And the charts were full of numbers and lists. And they were like they repeated over and over and over again. And they referenced... 
names of things in the world, like t- kinds of magic and, you know, sort of they had a caste system in the world and, and it referenced the caste system and there were all these rules that went along with it and I kept reading it. It took me, it took nine-year-old Jim uh, like three months of his life and the help of a friend who was also nine, whose older brother played D&D to figure out that the back half of that book was a Dark Sword role-playing game. Now, to me, that was fascinating. I played RPGs on the NES and things like that, and then, you know, all the standard RPGs you play when you were nine in the, like, late 80s, early 90s, like Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior, and I, so I'd played all this. I loved role-playing games, and this is, and I'd heard about D&D, but I'd never really got into it, and then I was like, okay, how does this work? I tried to play it with a friend, but he hadn't read any of the books, so all of the the terminology was just completely lost on him. Like, there was just so much weird magical jargon, and he had no context for it. So I was like, oh, damn, that's not working. So it took me a couple of years to really figure it out, but that was the first tabletop role-playing game that I have ever come into contact with. And that went it went from there to playing Warhammer Fantasy at camp to writing my own system because I couldn't afford books and playing it with my friends to LARPing in high school, which is actually where I met Dan. Uh <laughs> To running D&D and all kinds of other games and writing my thesis and blogging and who knows what else. But it was, a, it was the, it, my introduction to RPGs came through the form of a novel and was undoubtedly formative to my entire existence. It, it, it is part of what makes me who I am. As weird and stupid as that sounds. I don't know, it's weird and stupid. <laughs> it's a little weird. Maybe it's just because I know you. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't imagine me any other way. Yeah. But, uh, Dan, you've had a lot of time to think? I have. I have. Um, And as I've mentioned before, at some point in either the distant past or future, um, I do find it very hard to answer this particular question. Um, And so the the one I was thinking about when you asked me was, uh, I'm going to bust out an oldie but a goodie, uh, The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass. Oh, I got a copy on the back there. Yeah, yeah. So The Tin Drum was one of those books. I didn't pick it off the shelf at random. I did pick the first Gunter Gross book I ever read off the shelf at random. It was local anesthetic. I'm just like, I went through this phase where I'm like, all right, I'm just going to pick books off the shelf at random and let's yep. see how it goes. Uh, and I read local anesthetic and it was okay. And what it did was encourage me to read more Gunter Gross, at which point I picked up mm-hmm. the Tin Drum. And it... Which is real good. It freaking blew my mind in some ways that... Um, it took me a long time to be able to quantify. And then I'm still quantifying. Because mm-hmm. it's one of those books that I have reread, I have gone back to, I have found parallels with in, in um, all kinds of other books from uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Salman Rushdie, um, any kind of magic realism kind of sort of scenario. Um, and so the Tim Drum is basically this, this story about a boy in growing up in um, Danzig in, mm-hmm. in like the the early Cold War so after World War II um, and, and like anything that's got to do with Gunter Grass it takes place in that area of, of Germany slash Poland um, that's sort of gone back and forth and that has all this history and all this kind of craziness and all this stories and the thing it's about this boy who decides as he's being born he hears these moths drumming around a light bulb and at that moment, he decides that he's a drummer. That's what his purpose is, and that's what he will always be. And he begins mm. to drum. And so his parents buy him these drums. And throughout his life, he goes through through hundreds of these tin drums. And at some point, he's like three years old. He decides he doesn't want to grow anymore. He's just going to remain small, but he doesn't want his parents to become suspicious. So he decides he's got to fake an accident. So he takes two big jars of jam and puts them under his, his arms, and he throws himself down the basement stairs. And so with the broken glass and the jam, it looks horrific, and his parents are terrified, and they understand that later when he doesn't grow, well, that was why. Yeah. When really, he just decided not to. So, I mean, the boy sort of has 
quasi magical kind of awareness and quasi magical powers and there's these images upon images upon images like um there's this image of him hanging out under his stepmother's petticoats like layers yep. and layers of petticoats and then there's oscar there's this fabulous image of a man eel fishing by taking it a horse's head a worm ridden horse's head and throwing it into the into the bay mm-hmm. and then pulling it out an hour or two later and it's like writhing with eels right and like just this sort of magical kind of language the the power of images and then just the history of eastern europe sort of that idea that complicated histories have more than one side and it's often not the expected side that when when you look at a history of an area like that you were sort of given an expected narrative in western history and that's the narrative you expect to see but sometimes when you read books written by people in these areas and and marquez is another good example of this because he has all these colombian narratives which is north americans we don't know and understand um and Grass is a controversial figure, um, especially sort of lately in the in the years before he died because of his um, some of his involvement in, in what he did during World War II or what he didn't do and all this other sort of stuff. Um, and so as a German sort of living in this Polish area, um, I don't know. There was just there was so much I learned in there that I, mm-hmm. I can't – like I said, I haven't, I'm having trouble sort of expressing it because a lot of it is sort of happening on levels that – It's intriguing to me. So, so I, I, can't I explain. read the Tindrum years ago at Dan's behest. I borrowed his copy and read it because I like, will give it to anybody else to read it. this book. <laughs> and I did, and it was really good. Uh, but the thing, the thing that I love about it and like my, my sort of the part that really sticks out for me is um, – the, there's when, when Oscar is, is a grown man well I mean he's a man he doesn't yeah. grow anymore but he spends a bunch of time as an art model yeah and the the book takes a lot of time to talk about how his his figure is sort of lumpy and small and misshapen and and all of that but he loves being an art model and and like like he he just he carries himself with with this sort of uh confidence because his awareness and his sense of self is just vastly more than his physicality yeah and it always has been in throughout his life it's sort of um and it's often the case so you'll have something like this that sort of i I would classify as sort of a magic realistic kind of thing where almost everything in the world is normal Mm -hmm. except you have one or two things which are different yep and those things are often sort of key to defining what that story is about. Um, I think the first magic realistic thing I ever read was The Man with Enormous Wings, which is about this otherwise ordinary man in a small Colombian town. He was kept in a cage. And the only thing that is different about him is that he has enormous wings. And he's a very sad man. And it's sort of it's a story, it's a story about captivity and what happens mm-hmm. when you keep an animal captive and this, that, and the other. Uh, but it's sort of a good example. Like everything in the story is perfectly normal, except that the man has very large wings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things like 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 as somebody who who doesn't always feel at home in their body. It was, mm. it was interesting to read about Oscar, and and yeah, he was just he was so matter of fact about it. Yeah, well, that takes you out of the real to see the real, right? Yeah. Like it takes you one step away from reality, and just that one step is enough to sort of realize that uh, past all the magic and past all the wonder and past all the literariness of it, uh, the, all the real issues are still under there, and that's the one thing that. Um, I've often responded to anybody who's criticized sort of Grass's politics or or questions his sort of ideology. It's like, well, read the books. I mean, that's one thing. All you have to do is read the books. And as someone who's read basically every word he's ever written, you know, it's it's all that controversy, all that doubt, all that sort of self tearing and self sort of uh, that guilt and that that sort of stomach tearing two-ness that is germany after world war ii right that is that german identity is all in there and it's sort of fascinating it's funny because it dovetails into um our, our topic we we sort of thought about it and, and each of us has an era or genre of literature that or books that we are fascinated with and yours is early and mid 20th century especially like espe- modernism and yeah yeah well in, in specific parts of modernism um i really enjoy uh, Edwardian fiction, like it, British Edwardian fiction. I sort of have a fascination with these periods where um, the people living in them, like the, the the world around them has completely changed, and mm-hmm. the people living in that world are almost completely oblivious to that fact. Um, and sort of then the authors use this sort of disparity to sort of push and examine 
um, what exactly is going on. A good sort of contemporary example of this is like a show like Downton Abbey, which is the same yeah. time period, Edwardian period, where um, this family in this in this 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 rich upper crust family their their life is gone their world is over the the way they live has is is completely irrelevant and they are spending the entire show slowly realizing that that is the case yeah um and sort of my sort of go-to example for this kind of thing is usually um uh virginia wolf um just because sort of her work was uh, groundbreaking as far as content goes, groundbreaking as far as feminism goes, and, and women writers, but also groundbreaking as far as like content and how structure and how how she expressed these sort of changes and, and um, shifts in, in sort of societal values and how she looked at class and, and mm-hmm. sort of empire and sort of this whole destruction of, of of Britain as it knew itself. Like I mean, after World War One, imperialism was over; they just didn't know it yet, and it sort of took them forty or fifty years to figure it out. Um, and I, I sort of like modernism in general for for that sort of uh, examination of of the old systems and the new systems and sort of there was you have um, and you have a lot of modernists doing a lot of things that we now see as reprehensible. Um, T. S. Eliot and and some of these other poets had had sort of fascist leaning. Some of them uh, they did some did and said and thought some things that we sort of find reprehensible. But they made this artwork that was sort of very challenging and very difficult and very sort of intense that took a lot of study and it took a lot of sort of consideration. So there's mm-hmm. got, you have a lot of metaphor, you have a lot of illusions, a lot of that kind of stuff. And it's it's harder to read now even than it was then because we don't have the classical education that yeah, we've been Yeah, well, you don't, have the, you don't have the context. No, exactly. But it's one of the things I love about that era of lit is the sort of slowness of it. Yes. Um. You know, you read you read books like um, I'm trying to think of an example that isn't Last of the Mohicans because the first <laughs> one that read that leapt to my mind. My problem with Last of the Mohicans is that it is fantastically racist. <laughs> um, it is not alone in that regard either. Uh, Moby Dick, mm-hmm. somewhat less racist, um, but. Like they're the, between, but the pages between, you know, someone lifting a harpoon and throwing it. Yeah. There's there's seventy pages in there, and it's a history of whaling and different a taxonomy of whales, and the uses for whale oil, the notion that whalers are are the anointers of kings, mm-hmm. and you you learn a lot, like. About the anatomy of whales, for one yeah, thing. like like there's this moment like, like in a contemporary book where where you're like, and then he raised his gun, and then he shot, and the next, then then the next thing, like you, you're keeping that pacing. Herman Melville's like, I'm gonna let you finish this, <laughs> but first I'm gonna take you to school about whales. Welcome to whale school. First off, whales don't travel in schools; they travel in pods. Do they travel in pods? Dolphins I think travel so. in pods. I think so. I think whales also travel in pods. It sounds legit. Cool. Mm-hmm. We're talking about books, not whales. But like, it's just it, and, and it's it's that thing where it just takes its time. It has you, know, you have all the time in the world. You know, partly because you don't have a huge publishing scene, so Herman mm-hmm. Mel- Melville's not competing with ten thousand other authors. Yeah, all of whom are on your Kindle, et cetera, et cetera. Who yeah. Herman Melville's like? I uh, you might call this the, one of the great American novels. Yeah. Well, and there are there are definitely problems with with early twentieth century modernist fiction. Like there's, um, and and sort of the most common ones that are, are are sort of you know the patriarchal nature. So you get like your sort of your epics like Joyce and Hemingway. Sort of all these sort of um, uh, white men writing sort of manly books about man things. Um, and those and those you know those criticisms are valid for sure. Um, but that doesn't stop them from being good books. Uh, and part of the reason that Virginia Woolf I think is so important is because she was sort of um, a, a woman writing in that same time and writing the same caliber of writing and doing the same things and, and sort of facing that sort of same literary challenge. Another great example is, is Margaret Lawrence, who is mm-hmm. one of my favorite authors sort of ever. Um, and, you know, and you, and you sort of address the racism. Um, there was, we had some really good conversations about Evelyn Waugh and Scoop, <laughs> which if you have ever read I, um... is... is um, and I, I will regret saying this, I think, but... No, I won't even say it. Anyway, it's it is it is. <laughs> we read it. I read it. Um, so it was it was. I was in a class. I went back to school. Everyone was sort of ten years younger than I were, and they couldn't get past the racism. 
right? So the book is I, the book is racist. There's a lot of that thing going on, but they couldn't get past it. They couldn't get to the level of some of it was just sort of. I don't know what the, the phrase to use is, but ra- racism indicative of the time period it was written. So there's that sort of base level that is in anything that was written at that time. But be, above and beyond that was Waugh poking and poking and poking at the British upper class and the British system and British colonial and just poking so, and poking so, and poking. But they couldn't get past the fact that it was there to move on to why it was I, there I would, and what I would, it was about. I would, I would make an argument that uh, we have a term for the ability to get past racism. Uh, white privilege. <laughs> I mean, sure, but, <laughs> but but that is a topic for a different podcast. But, but the point there is that you can't understand what the book is about if you're not willing to sort of understand the context within which it was written. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you don't have to understand it; you don't have to want to. Uh, and that's like I said, that's another. I, I'm aware of the criticisms of modernism, like as as I read it. But I find that part of the challenge and the interest in modernism, yeah. right, is, is exploring those kind of ideas and seeing how they were explored at the time. So, Huck, you have. Uh, little to no experience with modernism. I I, went, I gave Huck his first modernist book tonight. I uh, probably which was Mothering Heights by Emily Bronte. I well, probably read some of it. That was modernism. No, that's fine. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I I probably have some experience. With I can it. just it's give you my copies of Gravity's Rainbow if you want. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just um, I haven't thought about it, so I don't have anything intelligible to say about so it. So what is your what is your your theme or genre of choice then? It, it was kind of interesting when you. When when we were talking about it, and you're like, I know what you're going to say, Huck. And I you said, were, I you think were, I know. And you were, you were not that far off from the mark. So you like, broadly speaking, nonfiction, narrow, yeah. narrower, self help, but it's a subset of self help, really, um, and it, and it's a little bit more encompassing than than the self help books. Um, I, I'm going to kind of put a label on it and say system deconstruction. It, it's kind of a cross section of self help, sociology, pop psychology. Like there, there's certainly problems with it. Uh, it's uh, it reminds me of. Um, I, sadly, I don't have any of the names, but it's the story of um, you know World War Two or something, and they wanted to figure out how to reinforce their bombers in order to ensure that the bombers always made the right or always came back from the the. Um, uh, the runs, right? Because like you can't arm the entire bomber because then it's too heavy to fly and it's too slow. Um, but you can't remove the the bomber's armor because then they'll crash. And so for the longest time, they would take a look at the bombers that came back and and then put armor plating wherever the bullet holes were. And some economist or whatever is like, "Why are you doing that? The, they cl- clearly came back." You need to look at the bombers that didn't come back and see where their those bullet holes are, yeah. and then reinforce those areas. Robert Robert McNamara tells a story like that in Fog of War. Yeah, yeah, it, it might be that that the story that I got it from was pulled from there. So obviously, there's there's going to be you have to have some sort of skeptical skepticism when you read the story of successful people and the recipe for success that they used because Mm -hmm. there might not be a universality to it. It might just be a confluence of luck, right? It's, it's sometimes it's a little difficult to, to run an experiment to test for those kinds of things. Yeah. So, but I still think, and it's the same with, um, in the last podcast where we talked about formative books, when I talked about Theodore Roosevelt, that when you take a system, in this case, I'm going to use system broadly, and kind of try to break it down into some basic constituent parts and then play around with those, I think there's some value to that. Um, So when I read a self-help book, a system deconstructor, I don't read it as a literal guide on how you ought to do something. I I treat it more like if I were to collage and I would cut out the parts that I like and paste them all together. It's kind of like stealing from authors. You know, great authors steal from other people. So I'll take a little bit of this system and a little bit of this system and I'll try to work it in. And if it works for me, I'll keep it. And if I don't, I'll jettison it or I'll forget it because it didn't stick enough for me to remember to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... You know, as much as I rail against uh, books like Outliers by Gladwell um, or networking books or whatever, I still find value in that case study approach. Um, you know, and Gladwell does that really, really well. He makes the stories really, really accessible by taking these case studies and trying to break it down into something that's, you know, the the cause is something that you didn't think of, like the hockey kid or the 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 children in hockey example. Have you ever heard of that one? 
No. The idea that if you look at a cross section of uh, hockey players, there's a disproportionate like okay, if you were to look at hockey players, how would you how would you expect their birthdays to fall? I have no idea. Well, randomly, you would like, think you yeah. you think randomly, but disproportionately, they're clumped around a certain three month grouping. Huh. And it all depends on the cutoff dates for for like pee wee hockey. For ho- it starts in hockey and goes all the way up to the the pros. And you look at any sporting level where they have cutoff dates for the ages, and you'll see the same grouping that huh. the, huh. the day yeah, after the sense. cutoff. Yeah, the f- there are more of the people or more of the kids are going to be born in like the first month, then a little bit less in the second, a little bit, and then there's a really small smattering. And the the when you spot that pattern, you realize what's going on. The kids born. The day after those cutoffs have an entire extra year of physical maturity to develop to become mm-hmm. bigger and stronger than their peers while still being the same age. Yeah. yeah, and then those bigger kids get more coaching. That coaching kind of stacks on top of each other, and suddenly you have hockey all stars who have natural talent. But it's not really natural talent. It is you happen to be born and you happen to be physically larger than the, your peers and then you happen to get more attention from coaches. Mm-hmm. And then when one of those kids actually does have natural talent you got freaking Wayne Gretzky. Yeah, well and, and, <laughs> and, and in his book um, in, in Outliers he tries to make the uh, the argument that there is no real like natural talent. Almost any instance of natural talent comes from hard work and, and deliberate practice and whatnot. So nobody like Mozart was a child genius, but he also had a lot of practice under his belt before he was discovered. He kind of put in his time behind the piano or composing and whatnot behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those those kinds of stories I, I tend to gravitate towards. And other things like um, Jim Collins is good to great, where they take uh, really successful companies and they break down where that that success came from, you know, the hedgehog concept versus the fox. The hedgehog does something really, really well, in this case, balling up into a ball, where the fox tries to do a lot of things really well, but the hedgehog usually succeeds more because it can do that one thing really well. Anyways. That's when you roll the hedgehog into a river. <laughs> and you get the hedgehog to unroll. Yeah, no. I learned that from uh, G.W. Burgess. No, it, it's, t- it's totally <laughs> Friends tr- of the forest, motherfucker. Often, right here. There's often going to be a, a kryptonite for that one really good tactic, <laughs> but... It's so like, yeah, Jim Collins is good to great. Um, never Eat Alone. Um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. That's a classic. Stephen one Covey's one, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Uh, John C. Maxwell, the, the Laws of Power. No, that's a different guy. He did, uh, well, I read Intentional Living recently. So, like, all these books, they they lay out systems where the you author... really are Lawful Ryan. They lay out systems that... You know, seem to make sense. <laughs> These books drive me crazy. Yeah, I can I can understand how. And the, the one thing that so a lot of uh, my other buddies who will we we do try to have like a mutually Im- improvement society mentality of trying to push each other to do really well. One of the things I often get criticized about is I read a lot of books or I read a lot of blogs or whatever, but I never translate that reading into action. It's, it's, it's the one downfall of, of like the self-help books is there is a lot of really good ideas, but the, those ideas don't often get translated into building better habits that, where you mm-hmm. actually put those good ideas into practice. I have definitely read some of those blogs um, and flipped through some of those books, and I can safely say that I have adopted basically none of those habits, except <laughs> that I will, after the fact, be like, oh... Oh, that would have been really useful. Mm, I've done that. Oh, now I feel like a garbage human. <laughs> Why am I such garbage? All I had to do was learn this lesson that I deliberately would set out to learn. And that, yeah, that's not a... That, that, I, I don't learn those lessons anymore. I don't read those lessons because I don't learn them, which is a terrible and self-destructive cycle. See, I find those books useful for, like, if I'm learning a specific thing, like I'm learning how to do a specific thing, I find... Specific mm. logical books like that useful, but mm. as far as like, and, and one of my views is all books are self help books. Yeah, right. And like, especially like when I read a book that I'm going to get something out of, I like to be able to have to pry it on myself. Right. I'm just one of those persons. If it's going to make me a better person, I feel like I need to do some work to, to in order for that to stick. 
And it's always subtle. The stuff I gain and the stuff I grow when I read a book is subtle. And I don't even often realize it till years later. I pry it out myself, and that's how I kind of like it. Mm-hmm. So those sort of books where they tell me how to be a better person, I get a little indignant. I don't mm-hmm. need them to tell me how to be a better person. I'm going to go out in the world and figure out how to be a better person. But, would- it's, but, I, but you know, if, if they'd phrase mm-hmm. it in a different way, like because the stories you're saying, like the thing about the airplanes and the thing about those statistics in hockey, like they're really thought-provoking. And when I think about them, I come to some conclusions that are probably the same conclusions they're going to tell me. Yeah. I guess maybe I just resent having it rammed down my throat. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, would, I would actually make an argument that those books are not telling you how to be a better person. As somebody who spent mm, uh, two entire degrees uh, learning to, how to tell people how to be a better person, uh, what those books are instead teaching you, because they're, they're, not, they're not telling you, like, what is best in life? They're well, not teaching. I'd be better at something, or but, but they, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, what they're trying to teach you is how to be better at the skill of person. Yeah, you know, and, and there's a distinction I think between being a good a good person and being good at personing. Mm-hmm. I think everyone everyone within the sound of my voice knows someone who is quote unquote good with people, uh-huh. um, who. They would never ever ask to help them to move. I'm terrible at personing, but I mean I'm an all right person. <laughs> but but it, like it's, it's one of those and, and it, having someone help you move, of course, being the like the core thing that good people do. Good people go around and help help other people move because it involves struggling. Struggle, which is purely for the sake of others. That's why there's a hilarious Seinfeld uh, episode about that exact thing because they're all terrible people. Hmm. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to help anyone move. No. You do so because I want to help Jim move because I owe him several times over. But that—that's exactly it. <laughs> but it's because I owe him several times over. Yeah. Well, I like <laughs> helping people move. So, so just to cap off the section sure before do. we move over to to your um, genre tastic <laughs> section. Um, I, the way I the way I view it, um, contrary to what maybe some of the authors, the way they emphatically might suggest that there's only one way to be a better person or to be better at your finances or to be a better lover, be a better man, whatever whatever the topic of the book is, I never I never assume that premise to be true. That this is the one authoritative view of how to be better at X. I always see those emails that tell me how to be a better writer. <laughs> they want to. What was it? Make make your make your pen is bigger. Like the grammar is terrible. <laughs> yeah. But so, but the way I the way I view these as um, it's it's sele- it's giving you a showcase of tools, a selection of tools that you select and put into your own toolbox. Because mm-hmm. for me, when I think of myself, I think of myself as fairly ignorant, lazy, stupid. All these like really negative things. It's very uncharitable. It's very uncharitable. But the thing is, is I I overcome that through trying to instill good habits and putting systems in place where it removes the options or it removes my ability to to be lazy. So like going to the gym, instead of making a conscious choice to go to the gym, it's an automatic response of like I come home, I do this, then I go to the gym. Mm-hmm. When I uh, want to like read uh, read books or whatever, I commit to I have to read one page. That's it. On some days, I only read one page. More, more often than not, I read more than one page, and I get that reading done. I commit to 30 minutes of studying. I put these systems in place because I don't trust myself to make decisions because I'm always tired, cranky, hungry, horny, anything. There's always a reason to not do or accomplish something. Hungry is a legit reason. Hung- hungry is a legitimate... Like, there's so many times when it's just like, ah, oh, man, I need a Snickers, otherwise I'm, I'm just a horrible person. Because you don't want to get hangry. I don't welcome, get welcome hangry. Welcome to Wootsu Riot, where we are broken men. No, yeah. actually, it's, it reminds me, um, when we played Battle of the Bards, they asked me for two sentences of intro uh, to introduce the, the band. And I said, okay, um, give me a second to think about it. And, I, and they gave me one. And I, I settled on uh, here at Woodsuit Riot. We're a YouTube channel where we make each other braver on the internet. And I believe you've just encapsulated you've just encapsulated some of that and why why you're here. So that is that is why system deconstructing is is Fair. something that I gravitate Fair. towards. Your cord is a relic. And Jim. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dan, for that complete non sequitur. Um, no, non sequiturs I, by Dan. That's our new video series coming up. You can see that um, whenever we manage to make it. 
So mine is unsurprisingly science fiction. Yeah, no kidding. I write about science fiction books at Matter at Lab. Have you notified Australia? Uh, no. But yeah, it is. It is not a, really a shock to anybody. But I read a lot of fancy books too, and I have a lot. Of, I have a lot of both. But it's for a sort of a weird reason. I mean, I think about science fiction. I used to be into it for action and technology and and that kind of thing. But more and more, the thing that interests me about sci-fi is the sort of story of potentiality that's there. Lots of sci-fi that's about people, or like specifically humans, um, isn't just about exploring space or, or achieving great technological things or creating technological dystopias. It's about sort of trying to use technology to become the person you were supposed to be. I mean, in the, in the, in the same way that fantasy often, when, when you get into fantasy books that have prophecies or uh, ancient history or things like that, you it's the notion is that you are you're telling the story to realize the person you have always been, uh, and they mix that a lot. Like the, 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 this is in the hard and fast genre. Uh, a good example of um, sci-fi employing that kind of trope is Battlestar Galactica. The new Battlestar Galactica show is has a has a prophetic fantasy theme. Uh, which I have arbitrarily put in the realm of fantasy, but it is the, the whole point of those of, of the, the drama and those characters is to reveal not who they can become, but who they have always been at their core. And it sort of throughout the, the show strips them down until they are naked. Um, and that's often where they find their power. So there's something very fantastical about that. But the science fiction stories that draw me in are are, are those people who uh, try and change and become, and specifically through technology. Shockingly, technology is a big part of my identity. Spoilers: I'm the one that edits all of these. Um, like it's it is part of who I am, and it I'm drawn to to cyberpunk fiction, you know, Snow Crash and stuff like that, which is all all you know. Shadow Run. It's all about people sort of changing and augmenting their bodies and minds in order to become more. I mean, you get into to the darker side of that with literally every story ever told by super or about super soldiers, not by super soldiers. That those are different sets of stories. I wonder what kind of book Steve Rogers would write. Probably really banal children's books. <laughs> <laughs> Be like, you know, Iron Man's like, yeah, I wrote three novels on physics. Steve, what have you been up to? I wrote a book about a bunny. Why would you do that? Because I was in the war, and I wanted to write a book about the bunny. Oh, okay. The same thing happened in modernism. <laughs> but, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'm just saying. I know, like, like it's it's... I mean, you get all these stories in video games, especially about so and so started a super soldier program, and it's like the the cheapest trope in in shooter video games of blah 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 super soldiers blah blah blah. Now they're tearing up tanks like paper, and you have to fight them all with your with your guns. But I mean, that's that's that story of technology gone wrong. It's it's technology that tries to make people better, and it it imagines that. One of the things that it's predicated on is that notion that how we are now is not the way we are supposed to be. It's not the way we are meant to be. We are meant to be better. Um, There's a line from Babylon 5. I wrote a post about it, actually. uh, Words of Power post years ago. I'll dig it up for the show notes um, about it. Uh, Delenn was the character who said it or, or, or who was said about rather and it was that notion that to her we are more than we think we are we care more 
and it's this this idea that that advancement isn't just you know metal limbs and enhanced cognition it's improved empathy it's a better understanding it's stronger connectivity like it it it's the notion of improving your relationship with others as well as anything else and i find it fascinating like that the, but the story of that is is in essence a story of alienation hmm. you have to you it, it only it only that story only works if you feel alienated now there's that um, Jonathan Colton song, uh, "The Future Soon," which is a funny story about robots. But the the line that always hits me is 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 um, the things that make me weak and strange get engineered away, and it's this idea that through technology he will fix himself because he feels broken or flawed, and whether you fill those flaws with lead or with gold. Um, they will make you whole, and ideally, in in a far off future, they will make you shine. And that is the thing I love about sci fi, is is that kind of weird ass stuff. And often, like the the the, the if the Dan Fun version of a book is a book that you have to like dig into and extract the meaning from the Jim fun version is where you're just given this book and you have to make up your own meaning. And I find that meaning in stuff and I really like it. I mean, whether that's deliberate, like books about shadow run or uh, Dr. Sleepless was a really good comic series about that. Also by Warren Ellis, because I don't think I'm allowed to talk about comic books that aren't by Warren Ellis on the podcast. <laughs> um, I think there's a... I, I, I think I signed a contract way back, possibly with the devil. <laughs> I didn't sign anything. But... I don't have anything to say. <laughs> yeah, but there, there's this notion of, of, you know, sort of failing forward and changing as quickly as you can until you, you reach not even perfection, but better. Mm-hmm. At some like, I used to read more science fiction than I do, mm-hmm. um, and there's at some point I just you succumb to the spell of 20th century modernism. <laughs> well, no, I just there's there's a point at which I find science fiction to be unsatisfying. Mm-hmm. Like there is something about it that it isn't meaningful enough, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's I like the thing I like about it is that that potentiality that you talk about, where we can talk about a future where we can. Um, change things or make things better. We sort of joked while we were uh, prepping this. Uh, Star Trek was an example we used. Yeah. And uh, and the joke was that Star Trek was about our shiny, happy future until Gene Roddenberry died and then it got dark and interesting. <laughs> but there's, there's something about those sort of shiny, happy futures which always sort of... I don't want to even say ring false, but I'm just, I'm just inherently suspicious of. <laughs> um, and it feels like to me, like, and even the dark sort of dystopic sort of futures that that are more interesting i also sort of find somehow less meaningful um because no matter how in our actual dystopic present well or no or the horrible (laughs) things that we have actually done right like there is no way any science fiction book to me could possibly be as thought-provoking or as or as compelling or as interesting as as something about um an actual tragedy or actual victory that actually, like that, that humanity, humanity sort of has more experience with, or that is um, not necessarily real, but uh, presumably like real-ish, like that could happen. That's sort of more now or more mm-hmm. present, right? So, um, no matter what kind of possible holocaust you could imagine out in space in the future, no matter sort of how many sort of um, future humans or aliens or anything that you could kill off in some kind of horrible catastrophe that you could imagine, there's sort of no way that that could possibly be more meaningful than any kind of like, I mean, the obvious sort of, the obvious sort of example is the Holocaust, but even mm-hmm. something on a smaller scale, 
Like to me, sort of fiction or ideas that sort of explore those things that we've actually done and take implications from those um, or that sort of take place in things that are sort of actually present or were present and, and draw implications for those are just somehow, I don't know, they feel more meaningful. Mm-hmm. This isn't something I've sort of explored and you thought I, sort I of was thinking about it as you were talking. But It, it, sort in, of, it intrigues me that there's a sort of focus on the, on the tragedies of the past when there are so many tragedies in the present. Well, yeah, or even the present, like things that are happening now. But, but the tragedies is, of the is future also are... for another day. And a darker day. <laughs> or a lighter day. That's But no, I think you're right. The that but the, the the thing for me about sci fi, yeah, it, it isn't so much tragedy as it is sort of personal change. Yeah. Um and that comes in all kinds of ways, whether that's lessons learned or robot arms gained. Yeah. Also I want robot arms. I do not want robot arms. I think they would be better than my regular arms. I like my regular arms. They have hair on them, and I can do this way. Your robot arms can have hair on them, too. I guess so. But this is satisfying. As a final comment on this before we close it off. Sorry. That's the sound of Dan rubbing his arm hair at Ryan. Um, I I feel like there's almost two different kinds of cases we're talking about here. Like We're talking about um, watered-down versions of real tragedy (laughs) and projections of problems that we haven't yet encountered, that we don't want to encounter, but if we could learn a lesson through, say, literature. Yeah, using science fiction to solve future problems, that's sort of an intriguing idea like, that I do like. Like, it's the difference between describing a future holocaust and describing a future robot uprising that Asimov was trying to warn us about. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? Like, the idea of a, um, our ethics and laws Listen. are not able to keep up with the runaway te- technological yeah. innovation, as opposed to just... That's, that's our present now. Well, yeah. that's, and that's a really good example, because you've got... This sort of idea that until science fiction writers wrote about it, it never really had occurred to anybody that there could be an ethical issue there, like yep. AI and stuff like that. And yeah, once you once you sort of put science fiction into that kind of realm, right. then it becomes fascinating, mm-hmm. and then, then it becomes real because it's something that we don't yet have experience with, yeah. but we know that we will. Yeah, which is sort of interesting. Again, yeah. Mm-hmm. And AI, I mean, AI, I mean, like even talking about AI. Which is a whole other that's a whole other topic can of, of science fiction. can of baskets of worms. But it's it's it's, <laughs> it's that kind of thing that makes us come face to face with what makes us human. Yeah. Yep. And and the acknowledge of uh, other sentience. I can't read to, read to read books written by robots. I think you can read those now, actually. Really? Oh, there um, we the go. Policeman's helmet is nearly perpendicular. <laughs> <laughs> what a it's great a title! Book of poetry by Raconteur, I believe. There we go. He is a Turing machine. I'll have to look it up. I like uh, how you we'll gendered the Turing machine. Uh, as, as far as I know, he identifies as male. Oh, okay. Um, most of my Turing machine experiences with Alice, uh, who ident- not my niece Alice, a different Alice, who she identifies. If Alice as, is a Turing machine, female. she's doing a damn good. Is job. she? <laughs> she's got arms and legs and everything. She seems pretty human to me. <laughs> Oh man, Chinese room. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Brian. We're not talking about about Searle on this podcast. We'll do a separate artificial intelligence podcast sometime in the dim, dim dark future or the past. We may have already done it. It's oh. thinking meat. <laughs> It's the meat. Soylent Green is people! Dude, there aren't even any it's robots. People! In there. There are no robots in that. You just ruined everything. Um, if, you would like to, if you would like to ruin us, um, you can find us on Twitter <laughs> at Wootsuit or on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes or on, on YouTube. All of these options surround you. Uh, hang, hang out. Come and hang out. It's Don't follow me on Twitter. 98% of my tweets aren't posted. That seems fine. Follow Dan for his 2% of tweets, which are obviously... No, follow 2%. Robert Drayton instead. Also follow Robert Drayton. Do it. <laughs> Who is Robert Drayton? We'll look at him later. Do it. The Canadian Romantic. Look up the Canadian Romantic YouTube. Look it up. <laughs> and after you watch the first five seconds of the first one and you feel super uncomfortable, take a deep breath and keep watching. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> oh, God. Trust Dan. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And I'm Dan. We're Stay genre-tastic! I hate you so much, Ryan. Yeah, genre! Do you notice how we cleverly overlapped it over the outro so you can't even edit it out? Uh-huh. Yeah, what a dick. I'm still dancing. <laughs>